Welcome back to the Cloudcast. I'm your host, Brian Gracely, and another weekend perspective. Excited to be all with you all this weekend. Um, I want to dig into, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I want to dig into what feels like, um, and again, sometimes these things are totally serendipitous and they just sort of all happen at the same time, but I saw a number of articles this week, a number of sort of random data points, uh, trying to put a few things together here, in which we're kind of shifting from people looking at software as being a, a really valuable commodity and looking at the economics of software impacting businesses to now looking at the economics and the cost and the efficiency of the people actually building software. And I want to I want to frame that not in the sort of most common way that we used to, which was, well, we don't really know how to measure the value of software, so we'll measure everything in lines of code. And if people are developing X number of lines of code, then that's a, that's valuable, right? And there, you know, there, there are lots and lots of metrics within the software development space. That's not necessarily the only one, but that's sort of the one that comes up all the time when we think about maybe the, the incorrect way to, to measure software development or to measure the efficiency of developers, right? I mean, you can look at number of features and frequency of releases and how many features you released in a given, um, you know, time cycle. Did you meet, uh, you know, did you know your cycles for each iteration if you're doing agile development? You know, are you getting more efficiency if you're doing pair programming? I mean, there's all sorts of, of metrics that, that developers use to sort of measure themselves, but but the business didn't necessarily look at it uh, in, you know, really sort of, I don't know, big picture terms, right? They they always thought of them as like, well, okay, those are those are technical things. They sort of fit in the IT budget. And then we spent the last decade or so, uh, you know, from, you know, software is eating the world to developers in the new kingmakers to, you know, sort of all the proclamations that that software was something that every business needed to be. They needed to all be a software company that also happened to do banking, a software company that also happened to build automobiles, software company that also happened to do healthcare, or, you know, like we mentioned uh, on a few shows ago, you know, a software company that also happens to build fences, right? Whatever that means. And, and all that made a lot of logical sense. It made, you know, it was very easy and tangible for us to, you know, look at the experiences we were having with various types of companies. And again, a lot of these were, were dominated by sort of digital first companies, uh, companies who, you know, were, sort of cloud first, uh, online first. Uh, but, you know, all you had to do was look at, you know, other industries, look at automotives, which is a very hard goods, durable type of thing, right? I mean, you know, you're talking about physical automobiles, right? You know, automobiles moved from everything was about horsepower and styling of the outside of the vehicle and, you know, zero to 60, how fast the car could go to, you know, it became and is evolving to become, you know, in some cases they're fully EV and in some cases they're still hybrid and so forth. But so much more of the discussion as we talk about vehicles is about the experience within the vehicle, right? In-car entertainment and the battery systems and all those sort of things, right? Things that are driven by software, right? And we can expand this out to all sorts of different industries, whether it's, you know, how uh, people are trying to find new sources of energy, how we're looking at, uh, you know, doing healthcare and, and, you know, hopefully being able to deliver better care to patients and all these sorts of things that have a non-digital aspect to them, but software is, is changing so much of it. And, you know, as an industry, we've looked at that and we've been, uh, if you're in the software industry, if you're in the technology industry, you were like, this is great because not only did uh, we change the industry 20 years ago when we when we sort of unlocked the internet and unlocked connectivity between everything as as you know CEO John Chambers of Cisco used to famously say you know the internet's going to change how we live live uh, how we work live and play or how, you know something along those lines um you know essentially he was saying like the internet's going to change every aspect of everything uh and a lot of that proved out to be true again there were some companies that were uh, fast movers and others that were laggards and all those sort of things but i think we we generally sort of celebrated the idea that that this thing in software and how software was built and the ability to to uh, you know iterate with it quickly and all those sort of things was a um you know was a tremendous boon for the technology industry because it had brought it from being uh you know a sort of a weird set of nerds that just did back office things that were just about the efficiency of workers or counting or you know whatever it was be to really a kind of front uh, and center, you know, this was the experience you were going to have in working with company X, right? So, you know, we all sort of celebrated that. We all, um, you know, I think there was, you know, a lot of a lot of 
interest and pride and all sorts of things in, hey, you know, technology is now really at the forefront. It's something that that every business leader should be uh, very well, very well aware of. And we saw very many technology leaders eventually evolve into uh, business leader goals and all those sort of things. All that aside, um, we also didn't really, uh, in the same way that we do in other areas that we have very, very great accountability for how exactly something works. So for example, if you were to work in manufacturing, you know exactly what it costs for every every minute, every second uh, of trying to produce something, what every cycle of every machine being used costs, you know, and, and you really fine tune how well uh, you do something because essentially you're you're doing something that is very repetitive, right? You're doing something that, um, A, you want to be repetitive. Uh, you're trying to create high quality. So you're trying to reduce um, variation within the within the thing. Um, and also over time, you want to reduce the cost of building that so that, um, you know, as, um, you know, economies of scale happen, you're able to uh, drive greater profitability of whatever it is, right? Once, once you've sort of perfected the, the building of that thing, you want to try and build it as efficiently as you can. And, and that's been happening in, in lots of different industries. Like we've seen this in, in manufacturing, we've seen it in finance with what the cost of a trade is and how people, you know, view markets and the, you know, the, the spread between different things within financial markets and so forth. So we've seen it, you know, in a number of industries, but we've never really seen it in software. And I say that, and I'm sure there are people who, you know, have lived in the software development space forever. And they're like, man, you have no idea how much they, you know, the management, you know, like looks over our shoulder, keeps track of things. And I can very much appreciate that having lived in, uh, you know, on, in the side of the world in which we, we built products and have been product manager and have been, you know, sort of downstream of products being built. I mean, you're, you're always sort of dependent upon schedules. When is that next release coming out? When does that feature come out? Oh, are we getting it? You know, is it really going to come out on the 30th of the month or is it going to, you know, is it going to come out on the first of the month? Is it going to come out on the 30th of the month? Is it going to come out the last day of the quarter? You know, so I, I can very much appreciate that. And I appreciate the pressure that people that build software are constantly under because everybody expects that it's very easy to do. They always expect that the quality of whatever you produce is going to be great. Uh, and you know, there, there's never any expectation that it might be slightly slower, slightly buggy, uh, whatever, you know, whatever the downsides of, of you know, new technology could potentially be. But the reason I want to kind of dive into today is there's, it, it, it does feel like, um, and again, this is, this is a bunch of sort of random data points, but I want to try and connect the dots a little bit. If you've been listening to any of the large companies that are in the AI space, so, uh, you know, Microsoft in particular, let's just take them for example, at the last Microsoft earnings, uh, you had Satya Nadella talking about, you know, the, the revenues that they were generating from open AI and how a lot of it was being driven by, uh, sort of co-pilots or code assistants for software developers. And, you know, he sort of threw out a thing that said, hey, the amount of money we make now with with Copilot, you know, GitHub Copilot or Azure Copilot, whatever they're calling it these days, um, is now higher than um, all of GitHub when we first acquired them. And, you know, th that seemed like things that he was trying to make a big deal of. I mean, the reality is I don't think GitHub was making that much money at the time. So it's irrelevant, but whatever. But But he specifically called out that specific thing because of all the things in AI, especially the generative AI space, being able to allow software developers to augment what they do with some sort of AI co-pilot, whether it's you know helping you write code faster, maybe it's writing tests for you, maybe it's reviewing code, maybe it's helping you do design, whatever it might be. It is one of the most tangible things in the generative AI space that that anybody can point to because the demos are very straightforward. Uh, these models have all been trained on huge amounts of code bases, as well as the programming, you know, language, uh, essentially the, you know, the tutorials, the books about how these languages are supposed to work. Um, and because it is a, uh, kind of sort of a, a defined thing in many cases, um, its ability to, to do something valuable is, is very tangible, right? People can, can point at it and they can go, oh yes, we have software developers. They have this thing that augments what they do. I can demonstrate it for you. And, and the feedback from software developers for the most part has been, this is pretty good. This is, this is helpful, right? And we've seen numbers, you know, it's makes you 25% more effective, 50% more effective, sometimes more effective. Again, it always depends on the use case, but 
what's interesting about it is it's also the thing that because it, it is proven to be effective and because it has a very specific tangible use case, it's very easy for companies that are selling this stuff to go, oh, I can put a price on it, right? I can, I can charge you for that. And again, whether or not we figured out exactly how much is the right price for that or if, how effective developers should be, th that's still in flux. And that's, that's sort of not the biggest issue at this point. The thing is, we found a use case, right? We have, we have a minimum viable pro product, if you will, for Gen AI, and that is code assistance. And so that's fantastic. That's, that's great. Uh, I suspect in order for Gen AI to, to be as, uh, you know, world changing as many people are expecting it, or the stock market has priced in, or, you know, companies have, are, you know, beginning to bet their future on, it's going to have to do much, much more than just, um, you know, assist developers, but it's a very, very good task, right? It's a, you know, again, one of the things you want to be able to do is, is point to a very distinct use case and go, can we, can we solve that? Can we make it better? So let's check that box. Now, what's interesting about that is it gets into really an interesting discussion. And, and again, this is something that doesn't have an answer of what's our expectation for these software copilots, right? And I keep saying copilot. I don't always intend that to just be sort of GitHub, but copilot is a fantastic name and it's being adopted all over the place. So, you know, uh, code, code assistance, right? What do we expect from them? What do we expect from them? Do we, do we expect them to uh, augment software developers. So what we mean by that is, uh, you know, you should think of it as like for every software developer, you have a extra software developer that just happens to be, uh, you know, an assistant, right? So everybody gets an assistant and maybe that person is essentially their pair programmer. Maybe that, that, or that, that person, that assistant is their pair programmer. That assistant is maybe actively looking for, you know, flaws in the code, bugs, errors, whatever. Uh, maybe it's suggesting, you know, ways to augment the software. Maybe it's suggesting entire blocks of software, whatever it might be. Uh, maybe it's writing tests. Maybe it's writing, um, you know, the the tests in order to, to validate the software, right? That's That's one sort of assumption, right? It is, you are essentially purchasing or using an assistant for every software developer. And the assumption is the cost of that is, obviously not a one for one with the cost of the software developer, but hopefully uh, the cost of it is less than the augmentation that you get from doing it. So fantastic use case. The second question is, do we expect it to be a replacement, right, um, for the software developer? So, you know, will we be able to start having non non software developers, if you will, right? So, so think of it as, you know, kind of in the same way that the, the whole no code industry talks about, well, you don't have to be, you know, citizen developers, right? Maybe you could be a business analyst. Maybe you could be a marketer. Maybe you could be a, whatever you are. You're just a manager of a team. Um, you know, low code has sort of said, Hey, if you have things that you need to build some software for, but it's, you know, it's things that essentially you could, you know, draw out on a whiteboard and you could build some building blocks. It's just process stuff. You could do a lot of things with low code. Right. And so in that case, you're sort of, are you replacing a software developer or are you augmenting a, a you know, a knowledge worker, right? So we're now kind of getting into that gray area of like, is this thing targeted at software developers or are we starting to get into it's targeting non-software developers to give them the superpower of being a software developer, right? Do we eventually get to a point where we come up with some interesting language, right? Like obviously we've seen these, these examples from, you know, open AI and others where somebody just draws something on the back of a napkin and, you know, kind of points it at open AI and it goes, Oh, you would like to build a better mousetrap. Cool. Let me write all that software for you. And, and then we, we go, Oh, that's really cool. Right now we, we ignore the fact that it doesn't really, you know, exactly tell me how I am going to, how I'm going to test that, how I'm going to deploy it, how I'm going to do HA around it, all those sort of things. But the assumption in that in those types of demos is like, well, those things will just get done. They'll just get taken care of. And in those cases, you've, you've really sort of said, well, as long as somebody can think up the idea, um, you know, sort of the, the mythical people are sitting around at a bar on the back of a napkin, uh, but they have a, a great idea. Um, in that case, you're sort of replacing developers, right? So now we've, we've got a little more into the gray areas or in the spectrum. We've gone from like augmenting developers to augmenting non-developers to sort of replacing developers. And, and there's probably other things within that spectrum to consider. And so the question becomes, if you are looking at these types of tools, what's your expectation, 
What are you, what are you assuming? What are you expecting? How will you measure the success of it? And the reason I went through all that sort of long-winded stuff, and if you're still listening, fantastic, was there was a couple of interesting articles this week, right? The first one uh, was a LinkedIn post from Andy Jassy, who's now the CEO of Amazon, formerly the CEO of, of, of AWS. And he basically highlighted uh, the internal impact, um, again, whether it's 100% true or not, who knows. But he essentially wrote a long LinkedIn post talking about the impact of, of using these co-pilots to essentially help the internal Amazon teams with their legacy code bases to try and you know, modernize them or at least bring them up to, you know, up to a newer version, right? And again, didn't go into the details of like, hey, did I take some legacy code base and like modernize it and so forth? Or am I really just sort of moving from Java X to Z, Java Y, right? But the reason I highlight that is that is a example at a very, very high level. Now, granted, you know, Amazon's a technology company, but at a very, very high level in which they are measuring um, the efficiency of this augmentation system, right? In their case, they're talking about Amazon Q, but essentially it is a, uh, you know, developer assistant augmentation system, right? It's helping the current developers that are there that have to maintain these systems and it's augmenting them. And that's fantastic, right? It was it was great to see some numbers. Again, whether those numbers apply to your business or not doesn't really matter, right? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, but it was interesting to sort of highlight that. Now, the reason I highlight that and the reason I even bothering with this thing, because you know, for a company to come out and say, hey, we're eating our own dog food, okay, cool. Every technology vendor, every cloud provider does the same thing. Hey, we we all use our own stuff. Okay, great. What was interesting though was there was another article. That was more sort of a, and again, you're probably going to need to get behind a paywall to get access to this. Uh, I read some of it. I didn't read all of it. Um, the new AWS CEO, Matt Garman, uh, made some statements to his developers saying, you know, soon the developers might stop coding and the, you know, sort of coding assistants are going to start taking over. And again, those are things that oftentimes get taken out of context. But it was interesting just even within the same week, and you never know if these things actually happen within the same time frame. But you've got two parts of the company that are saying, you know, we're augmenting the software teams and another one saying we might be looking to deprecate some of the software teams or replace the software teams. Or, you know, maybe we do the sort of famous thing that, that everybody in technology does where they say, well, we're going to take you out of low value work and move you into high value work. Right? Maybe that's what they mean. But I highlight this because, again, it's even within the same company, it showcases that you know, you, you can have two very different perspectives on what do we expect these things to do, right? What's the future of software development going to be if we're moving from software is changing the economics of our business to what's the economics of those software developers? Because again, like I mentioned early on, for a while there, it was, you know, hire as many of them as we possibly can, because we will find work for them to do. And if, if you know, put in the right direction, pointed in the right direction, doing the right things, we are going to see outsized returns from using software to change our business. Now, next thing I sort of saw that was interesting was, uh, and this was a kind of a blog post, a Substack sort of thing. So again, take it with a grain of salt, was somebody working for a SaaS company. And essentially they were saying, hey, look, we provide this SaaS service. The service doesn't really matter, but they're saying I provide a SaaS service. There are you know, thousands of companies like this that provide a SaaS service and people integrate with their SaaS service to do whatever they do. And so he said, you know, a lot of my life is we publish an API that describes the service that we provide um, in lots of details. We have documentation about it. And as we're onboarding new customers, oftentimes we get requests from people that go, hey, something's not working. Um, you know, here's the block of code that I use to talk to your API. Can you give me some sense of what's going on? Um, and he says, you know, we, we do it, you know, for a while, it was very common to do a certain amount of small troubleshooting and in some cases, helping them rewrite their code. Uh, in order to be able to talk to their API, because if they could get them to talk to the API and they understood what the API did, then they potentially had a customer. And obviously, you know, that's valuable to a business or any business. And the whole point of the article was, though, that this person was saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to reach a breaking point in which or a boiling point or just a frustration point, because so much of the code that I'm now seeing, it's very clear to me that it is it is. Uh, you know, gen AI generated code, essentially a non-software developer saying, Hey, I need to work with uh, this service, or I'd like to work with this service, but I don't really know how to write software. 
And I, you know, also I'm going to go ask chat GPT or whatever to generate me the code that's needed to talk to this API. And he said, unfortunately, for whatever reason, that code quality isn't great. Right. And you, you can take a look at the article, but it, it did sort of highlight an interesting thing in my mind of, you know, how frequently are we going, are we going to see this? Right. So remember I talked about, are we augmenting software developers sort of the, you know, what Andy Jassy talked about, are we augmenting non-software developers, but we're still augmenting them with a the thing that writes code that sort of feels like a thing in the middle. Right. And we always said for a long time, like, you know, Hey, you should learn to write code, right? Don't be a coal miner anymore. Learn to write code. And, you know, for a lot of people, if if you don't come from a computer science background and, you know, the idea of like learning a language is a little scary, um, which I can relate to. Um, I've tried a number of times to sort of start to figure out this stuff without, you know, kind of working directly with somebody. It can be intimidating. And so the idea that you could just sort of ask a, a co-pilot type of service to say, hey, I have an idea. Uh, do this stuff, make it do this stuff um, here. I'm going to explain it to you as a you know human being would do um, is really appealing because there are plenty of times that I'm like, boy, I wish I could, I wish I could make some software do this thing because if I could connect A to B to C, there's an interesting business application for that or whatever it might be. Um, and so I think we're going to start seeing more and more of that. And while that's a great thing on one hand, it does sort of lend itself to you know, how much toil are we going to put on, uh, you know, what I will call real software developers, real DevOps teams, real SRE teams, people that, you know, essentially are, you know, having to interact with their customers and their customers aren't really qualified to work with them. And that's a weird situation to be in, right? Like if you're a fast food restaurant, like you don't ever think like, oh, my, these people walking up to get food aren't qualified to do that. But to a certain extent with technology, there is some expectation that you are marginally qualified. And, and again, this might sort of highlight another sort of downstream aspect of, well, if, if you're seeing that more and more and it's frustrating you, but you think those people could also be your customers, you're probably going to have to do more to make it simple enough such that they are no longer non-qualified, right? And you're going to have to figure out what those gaps are. And so I thought they were sort of three interesting data points on this spectrum of what's it going to be, what's it going to look like in a few years, um, especially as more and more companies, you know, vendor side companies are going, hey, the, the justification for AI, the simplest one that everybody can understand is software development co-pilots or, you know, code assistants. And so they're going to be pushing those and they're going to be pushing numbers like Andy Jassy push. And they're going to say, your life's going to be better, right? It's, you're not, we're not, we're not doing changing the world software. We're doing make your life better, save you money, make you more efficient, all those sort of things. And I'll be very curious to sort of watch the downstream of this because we've seen these types of things before, right? They are essentially technology presented as a silver bullet. And what happens is there are some people that are rational about it and others that are ir irrational. And the downstream effect of that is they, they jump in with both feet. They don't really understand the situation. They may decide, hey, we're going to you know, lay off a bunch of people that have a bunch of skills that we you know, use today all the time, but they're not necessarily going to be the most efficient in the new world. And so therefore, we want to you know, let them go and then go find these new skills that, that are efficient for the new world. Well, those skills don't totally yet exist, right? So anyways, I think it's going to be really interesting to sort of watch the downstream implications of what do people think these things do that are going to help us uh, enhance software developers? Um, are they looking to augment the developer? Are they looking to augment the non-developer? Are they looking to replace the developer? Um, are they looking to, you know, do other things on that spectrum, right? Like what happens in the split between junior coders and, or, you know, junior developers and senior developers, right? We've already seen, um, some changes happen in that space where, you know, companies are hiring, say less junior developers or their expectations, they're able to onboard them immediately. There's no learning curve. There's no sort of um, you know, training and mentoring programs. You know, what happens to systems integrators that are being asked to maintain these things um, and that run businesses? You know, are they going to uh, really embrace these things? Are you going to see customers asking them to cut their fees by 50% once they figure out that they're augmenting them? All those sort of things. So I think there's a lot of really interesting sort of downstream, you know, what's going to happen to the role of software developer and how much do these new AI assistants shape that 
versus, you know, their ability to, you know, kind of measure the work that they do themselves or the, you know, the work as a whole or whatever. So I think it'd be really interesting over the next few years to sort of see, does the AI industry sort of shift to this because it is a very tangible money-making use case, right? Does it, does it, does it push it higher to the forefront? Does it become important at businesses, right? Like how many businesses have lots and lots of developers, but, but that could be a lot of them. And then, you know, how, how do we measure that? What's it, what's it tangibly looking at and so forth. So anyways, um, a couple of data points kind of threw me in in this direction. It got me thinking about it, but it also got me thinking about, you know, kind of how this potentially again, shifts my, my sort of main thesis for today that we're, we, we may potentially stop talking about software in terms of it impacting the business from an economic perspective. And we talk about software in terms of measuring uh, developers uh, less, you know, from an economic perspective, and more from a cost of, you know, cost of goods inputted, you know, cost of cost of raw material, which I don't think any developer really wants to go down that path. Um, but I think it's something to sort of be to be wary of. Um, and again, I think there's probably going to be some good ways to do this, um, some bad ways to do this. We'll see some horror stories. We will see some, uh, you know, we'll see some case studies that are, you know, fantastic and new lighthouses for what this means. But um, I think it's something that's definitely, uh, you know, kind of worth keeping an eye on, especially as, as your business might be looking to to implement some of these things. Um, again, whether it comes from the top down or ground up and groundswell to go do it. So anyways, something to keep an eye on. Would love to hear your feedback as to how your business is, if they're looking at these, if you're using these tools um, beyond just sort of your own personal use, you know, how how is your business starting to uh, how to perceive uh, what the usage is, what the economics are, what they expect the economics to be, um, you know, and, and, and what do you think that the next steps of that might be? So anyways, that I'll wrap it up. Uh, thanks you all for listening. Um, you know, again, I am going to be traveling like crazy over the next six, seven, eight weeks. I think I'm gone every single weekend for the next six, seven, eight weeks. I will do my best to keep getting out the weekend perspectives. Uh, the Wednesday shows we are, we've done a, Aaron's done a really good job of, of making sure we're booked out for quite a bit of those. So I will do the best I can on the weekend perspectives. There may be a week or two again, where I'm I'm traveling a ton. My, my schedule just went from like manageable to insane over the last couple of weeks. So um, anyways, we might be doing some of these from, from different locations around the world. But anyways, thank you all for listening. Thanks for telling a friend about the show. Thanks for uh, helping us grow the show. If you ever have any questions, show at thecloudcast.net. Hopefully that uh, is the best place to, you know, to ping us about things, questions you want to be on the show, all that sort of stuff. So with that, I'll wrap it up. We'll talk to you next week.